part of uh, reviewing the reading from last week. I'm going to try to keep this one shorter. It's hard to upload the longer videos. Um, so it says, but if man is free to define himself the con for himself the conditions of a life which is valid in his own eyes, can he not choose whatever he likes and act however he likes? Uh, one of you brought in this passage um, to show that she is trying to argue against nihilism. Nihilism is that life has no meaning and thus there is no point to anything. Um, you might think that nihilists uh, are off, are common, uh, nihilists are commonly associated with uh, just darkness and being just sad and <laughs> depressed. It's not necessarily the truth, um, but it, it's what we, nihilism is nothingness, right? Um, but what she's saying here is, even Dostoevsky um, asserted, if God does not exist, everything is permitted. Um, she's saying that people use that concept for their own advantage in order to um, convince other people that without a prescription for how to live, um, humans will do whatever. They will start doing horrible things uh, because there is no morality from which to 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 live by. Um, and here, I, I think she's trying to explain that even that believing in, for example, a monotheistic religion, uh, believing in in a god from a monotheistic religion isn't necessarily going to keep you from doing bad things. Just because somebody is prescribing you and prescribing a morality for you doesn't mean that you're not going to do something wrong. For example, Nazism um, and what happened during World War II and many other examples in, in human history where people have used religion as a justification for doing something extreme um, and, and, and hurting uh, their fellow man or even um, hurting uh, other objects and subjects on, in our environment and hurting themselves. Um, I think She's not necessarily saying, I don't want anyone, a lot of people brought up, does she believe in God? She's not talking about that. She's not talking about believing in God or not believing in God. She's saying that believing in having a prescription for how you exist and only going with that and not thinking further and not confronting your own ambiguity, you will find a reason to think yourself as other or better or um, people as being less human than you are because you believe in something that makes you special, right? Um, and if you do that, if you believe in something that authorizes you to act in a certain way, um, that pardons you, that um, can uh, prescribe for you a morality, you will end up separating yourself seeing other humans as not human anymore, as less than. Um, and really, it should be the opposite, that it, when you think about, um, when you think about morality for how humans treat other humans should not be influenced by a uh, higher power um, in the end, is I, I think part of her argument here. Um, when humans start to recognize their own ambiguity, they recognize there is no prescription, there is no meaning to our lives other than how we treat other people in our existence today. Um, uh oh, this froze, so now you can't see me talking. All right, well, I'm just going to X out of that. And you'll just see the screen. I hope that's okay. Okay, so um, 
when we realize that we are in control of the meaning in our lives and we find meaning through other people, we might not see them as other anymore. And we'll see them as all sharing this difficult existence of being a conscious human, a conscious being on earth. Um, and we might recognize that their freedom is inextric inextricable from our own. Um, if we create something and we use something that can limit their freedom or we benefit from their freedom being limited, we are directly saying we accept being in a society where our own freedom is limited because we're all human. If I say you, my neighbor, can't do this because of how you look or shouldn't do this or should do this or I should treat you in a certain way because of how you will look or your socioeconomic position or your beliefs. Um, I am accepting that I'm living in a society where somebody can say that to me. That's her main philosophy, I think, that it's really stuck with people is that, is that concept of, of freedom. Freedom and human rights are literally everybody has to experience them or nobody does right and if you can't recognize that your privileges the way that you live is on the backs of other people if you don't look that in the head and accept that that's the truth then you're never going to live in a society where you can be free you're always going to be living in a society that accepts that other people can be used for object as objects for the means of something else, as means for the end of something else. So the end could be your safety, your happiness, but your happiness and your safety are contingent upon those people not having that. So you are okay with humans being treated a certain way in your society. And that means you're not really free. Again, this is coming out of World War II. She's coming out of a very difficult time. World War I had its difficulties of being a completely unnecessary war of attrition where people were sent into war. The more people who die, the more you were winning the war. And coming out of that and then going into that, which led to economic problems that led to people turning to a source that would give them meaning. So people becoming Nazis and, and agreeing with Nazism because they couldn't find any meaning in their lives. Their economy was bad. Somebody promised a good economy, but it was a good economy for the few on the backs of other people. But people who looked like the description of people who were going to benefit from that economy were OK with that, right? And so they said, OK. I'll ignore what you do to those people as long as I'm safe. And actually, knowing that you're doing evil things to people who look different from me or believe in something different from me makes me feel safer. So even people who didn't necessarily think of themselves as Nazis um, or think of themselves as anti-Semitic or racist um, but ignored what was happening because it made them feel safe, they were contributing to the problem. And Simone de Beauvoir is trying to think, you know, it, pe it, people like her who, who, who weren't impacted by the war in the same way as, as other people who disappeared around her or um, maybe more, even more active in the resistance than she was. Um, she's trying to think about how man, how can man how did it get to that point where man could do those things to each other? And the war ends with an atomic bomb. Um, that it's really incomprehensible. The atomic bomb itself is incomprehensible. How could humans create something to kill themselves um, in this way? To to, to mass murders of other humans, uh, we created an object that could do that in a way that we can't even war had become so separated. You don't even look into the whites of the eyes of the person that you are targeting. You could be on the other side of the world from them and target them. Uh, this separation from ourselves, from the other, from the collective of humanity uh, is so incredible and so normalized now. 
in a way, the internet, going back to the internet, I'm obsessed with this idea, um, going back to the internet, we, we're connected in a way that we have never been um, in good and bad ways. Uh, I hope that in the end it'll be good. We'll strive to be connected in positive ways through this, especially with the, you know, the coronavirus and things like that that keep us physically distanced. Uh, we'll use this as a positive way to be connected. But um, as of right now, the impact is to be so separated from our physical existence that we almost can't empathize with other people's physical uh, struggles anymore. Um, if somebody wants to write, find some kind of article about the internet and write and look at this book through that lens, that would be really interesting. I, I would love to read a midterm paper on that. Um, for the purposes of using this as a lens for the artifact of Beloved by Toni Morrison, focusing on freedom, um, freedom, what that means, and freedom, empathy, um, what it means to exist. Do you exist in the past? Do you exist in the future? Is it possible to exist in the moment? Um, there are new articles online right now about the idea that we don't live consciously we live in we our consciousness is not um is not continuous it's discrete or is it discrete and continuous can we experience life uh continuously like you're you're, you're experiencing your existence right now or is it discrete in the sense that you can only experience your memory of what just happened um or your hope for what will happen or your assumption for what will happen next um that would be a really interesting paper as well. Um, so focusing on this idea of freedom is very important, but I, you know, whatever you guys notice or a pattern um, that you notice, if it's separate from the concept of freedom is fine too. But this concept of freedom is, was the focus of Simone de Beauvoir's life. Like the strive for freedom and striving for happiness was, is, is human, the human condition to her. And for some people, personal happiness and personal freedom, they believe, requires the oppression of others. But it shouldn't, and it can't. You cannot achieve freedom while oppressing others. You're, you're, you're interpreting the term freedom incorrectly in that way. The characteristic feature of all ethics is to consider human life as a game that can be won or lost and to teach man the means of winning. Now we have seen that the original scheme of man is ambiguous. He wants to be, and to the extent that he coincides with this wish, he fails. All the plans in which this will to be is actualized are condemned. A rid the ends circumscribed by these plans remain mirages. Human transcendence is vainly engulfed in those miscarried attempts. But man also wills himself to be a disclosure of being. And if he coincides with this wish, he wins, for the fact is that the world becomes present by his presence in it. But the disclosure implies a perpetual tension to keep being at a certain distance, to tear oneself from the world, and to assert oneself as a freedom. To wish for the disclosure of the world and to assert oneself as freedom are one and the same movement. Freedom is the source from which all significations and all values spring. It is the original condition of all justification of existence. The man who seeks to justify his life must want freedom itself, absolutely, and above everything else. At that same time that it requires the realization of concrete ends, of particular projects, it requires itself universally. It is not a ready-made value which offers itself from the outside to be to my abstract adherence, but it appears not on the plane of facility, but on the moral plane as a cause of itself. 
It is necessarily summoned up by the values which it sets up th and through which it sets itself up. Jeez. Um, it cannot establish a denial of itself, for in denying itself, it would deny the possibility of any foundation. To will oneself moral and to will oneself free are one in the same direction. Okay, so this is the really important point. She's kind of working through her ideas to get to the point that is most palatable to the reader. Um, and that is it. To will oneself moral and to will oneself free are one and the same. It seems that Hegelian notion of displacement, which we relied on a little while ago, is now turning against us. There is ethics only if ethical action is not present. Now, Sartre declares that every man is free, and there is no way of his not being free. When he wants to escape his destiny, he is still freely fleeing it. Does not this presence of a so-to-speak natural freedom contradict the notion of ethical freedom? What meaning can there be in the words to will oneself free, since at the beginning we are free. It is contradictory to set freedom up as something conquered, if at first it is something given. This objection would mean something only if freedom were a thing or a quality naturally attached to a thing. Then, in effect, one would either have it or not have it. But the fact is that it, it merges with the very movement of this ambiguous reality, which is called existence and which is only by making itself be to such an extent that it is precisely only by having to be conquered that it gives itself. To will oneself free is to affect, here it is again, the first sentence and the last sentence of paragraphs are the most important. Um, if you want to skim, you read the first sentence and you read the last sentence, and then you ask yourself a question and try to answer it in the middle. To will oneself free is to affect the transition from nature to morality by establishing a genuine freedom on the original upsurge of our existence. So establishing a genuine freedom. Does she do this later? Does she explain this? Every man is originally free. So I'm asking a question based on this that I'm hoping will get answered later. Um, when you ask questions while you're reading, you're really practicing becoming a good writer. You're practicing asking those questions of yourself while you're writing. What questions will my reader be asking? How can I most clearly answer those questions without them having to ask them, right? Um, or can I set up so that they will ask? She may have written this assuming we were going to ask the question, what is this genuine freedom? And then she knows we're asking that, so she answers it here. That's a good writer. That's somebody who, who is very aware of their audience. Every man is originally free in the sense that he spontaneously casts himself into the world. So a lot of you were very focused on this concept of original freedom, um, that concept of natural, genuine freedom. Uh, we're free until the world starts to identify us. The world, our environment starts to control us. Our geography controls us. We're free to be whatever we want to be and exist as whatever we want to exist as until other people start to, or our environment start to put us in, into a category and expect certain things from us or expect us not to act in a certain way. Uh, that's why I really liked that idea with the octopus movie, my, the, my octopus teacher, because he doesn't give her a name because that would put an identity on her and limit her freedom to be and exist as whatever she, uh, whatever, or you could say whatever they um, are, just exist in the world without that identity. Sometimes an identity can be limiting. Okay, this is getting long. Well, I kind of got to the main points of this. Um, you can see the main points when you look at the last paragraph of any section. I mean, she ends it with therefore. That's, that's pretty significant to show that this is the final point of section one. Therefore, in the very condition of man, there enters the possibility of not fulfilling this condition. In order to fulfill it, 
he must assume himself as a being who makes himself a lack of being so that there might be being. But the trick of dishonesty permits stopping at any moment whatsoever. One may hesitate to make oneself a lack of being. One may withdraw from existence, or one may falsely assert oneself as being, or assert oneself as nothingness. One may realize his freedom only as a, ab, an abstract independence, or on the contrary, reject the despair, the distance, with despair, the distance which separates us from being. Being, my interpretation of this is, is being as a pure self, as being without, uh, without an ego, as existing without your mind um, and and society and I hate the word society but you know uh, your socioeconomic environment um, impacting you and influencing your ego um, but I would if I were to write a paper on this I would go back and make sure I understood exactly what her definition of being was um, I might even look at other papers of hers, other books of hers, to see what her definition of being is, and I would define it in my paper. So if you're going to focus on this concept of being in her writing, um, I would do that. All errors are possible since man is a negativity, and they are motivated by the anguish he feels in the face of his freedom. All errors are motivated by the anguish man feels in the face of his freedom. It's interesting to, it's a French translation, to have errors, mistakes, flaws, be something that can act. So it makes this sentence confusing. But they, they happen because we're afraid of our own freedom. We're afraid of that ambiguity that gives us freedom. So we put ourselves into cages in order to avoid recognizing our freedom to make of our lives what we want, to not live in those cages, to not do as others prescribe for us. Concretely, men slide incoherently from an, one attitude to another. We shall limit ourselves to describing in the abstract form those which we have just indicated. So she's saying, she's, this is kind of leading us into personal freedom and others. Okay, that was a lot. I didn't go through literally everything, but I tried to give you an example of how I analyze things. I don't have all the answers to the questions that I was asking. Um, I'm going to uh, next be demonstrating how to create a paragraph um, with quote analysis. Uh, I'll kind of skim through section the section for week four, um, and then I will... Uh, and then I will do that example of how to write a paragraph analyzing quotes, and I hope that you will use that in your writing. So section four. All right.